put the first wash on. And as you can see, I painted over the eyes a little bit. That was not my intent. So I'm going to take my little quarter inch flat brush. And I like to use this brush. All I have to do is put it down on the clean part and just move it back and forth and it pushes that paint back where it belongs. It's a miracle. I'm going to put this eye back where it belongs. It's damp, barely damp, not very wet. I think it's important to enjoy what you're doing and to enjoy watching what the paint does as it mixes on the paper and as it dries. So knowing that you can paint outside the lines or go over the lines and not worry about it, I think is a good thing. We've got plenty of other things to worry about in our daily lives without our art. To me, the eyes are the most important part of the painting, so I'm going to focus on those. I think I'll go ahead and do, now that I've dampened that, <laughs> I think I'll work on the eyes a little bit and that'll show you that besides the eyes, there's not an awful lot to worry about. <laughs> and I think I'll use my, my new Fibonacci brush, size six, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to start with a layer of the burnt sienna. He has reflections in the eyes, the light from above, and there were trees nearby, so it's a very mottled light reflection. So rather than masking that out at all, I'm just going to come in and paint around it on the iris of the eye. Dog's eyes are a little different from most animals in that the, the pupil, even though it's a, a small round spot, also blends out gradually as it goes into the iris itself. So even though you have that dark spot in the middle, the um, pupil and the iris are, well, that's lovely. And, The pupil and the iris are kind of one. I'm really just trying to blend this burnt sienna fairly evenly. I picked up a number two Starving Artist brush, which is a white nylon. Great for blending, lifting, moving paint. Because it's nylon, it doesn't pick up the paint while you use it which some of the softer bristle brushes will do, Kalinske's especially. And we will do a little bit of lifting in the eyes as well. While the eyes are drying a little bit, or the color is drying a little bit, I'm going to come down to the nose. Dog noses are pretty funny, and the more you paint them, the goofier they look. Um, the structure is important, and to know that it's not two circles, but flaps that kind of work their way around, and then there's the dark nostril. There's a line in the middle that separates these two, and then the same thing over here. You've got a little hole. And in his case, he's got some cute little round things underneath. A lot of people paint dog noses and they just dead stop at the top. They make a black and it looks like somebody took a clown nose and parked it right on his face. But what you need to pay attention to is the fact that the hairs, little tiny hairs, are starting actually from the tip of the nose and they're little short, fine hairs. And then the color, if it's especially if it's a white or a spotted dog, you'll notice that the color of the nose actually works its way up. 
and then you can blend that out as it goes further up the nose. In this case, he's black, so you don't really notice that. So I'm starting with cobalt. I think I'll put the basic shape of these in first. I don't usually hold a brush this close to the... My students saw me, they would... Let me have it. <laughs> of course, nobody will do that. Number one rule in my class is do what I say and not what I do. Because the minute I say don't hold it down closely, I'll be grabbing it right there. You're really much better to hold your brush back further. It loosens you up. It gives you more room to make good, nice, strong, soft strokes. When you do this, you can do it this and get all tight. Then your neck hurts, then your back hurts, and then you decide you don't like painting after all. A little bit on the light side. You didn't know we were going to paint blue and brown noses today, did you? It's darkest here. The light color up here is one of the lightest areas on this dog, and it's just the reflected light, and usually the nose is fairly moist, so it appears lighter. Right now, I'm leaving this little white paper dam or space between this area and this area. I'll come back in a little while after it's had a chance to dry some and then soften that color. And that way that light reflected on there from, in this case, below will still be there, but then the shape will still be retained. Dog eyes. These also have an, a ring around the outside, the iris. And they also have a pupil. Come in handy to have that. And they really sit higher in the eye socket than you think. Um, especially if the dog is looking up. This already has them brown. I'm using just the blue. It'll mix with that and give you a nice rich dark. The edge of this really needs to be softened. If you look at um, portraits where people look very severe, very stern, and you'll see that their pupils are little pinpoints. And then the ones that are the most attractive um, models, for example, if they're trying to look romantic, um, they really cut the lights down and then they turn them on quickly and their eyes are fully open, the irises are open. Um, they don't look like they're scared to death. More blue over here. It'd be good to have them about the same size, wouldn't it? And the ring around that one. You don't have a ring all the way around this one because you're actually looking at this from the side, and I think people forget that too often. A couple of other things you need to think about. The upper eyelid of a dog 
or a person. Cast a shadow over the eyeball itself. You can see this dark ring. And amazingly, you're going to use cobalt blue full strength. It's better to do that after it dries a little bit, but do what I say, not what I do. Comes all the way across and down. Across and down. The white that's reflected on this dog's eye tells you that the light's coming from this direction. Because this is a ball and it's uh, a liquid, the light is going to pass through this and creates a little crescent of light. on the opposite side of the iris. Which helps to give it the roundness that it needs. This is on this side, so this crescent would be over here. And if you're going to lift, it's best to lift in one direction. So you won't be taking it off, putting it back on, taking it off, putting it back on. Everybody goes, well, I tried to lift it. This is a brand new brush, and it's got a great point on it. Um, I kind of like it with a little bit more of a worn out effect. It's a little more rounded, and it helps you get into that. We learn lots of techniques from each other, and one I think that's very important when you're doing the eyes um, is to take a little bit of green. doesn't matter which green, to me, and put it at the bottom of the eye, and oops, after it dries is a much better time to do this. And it weights the eye at the base, and for some reason helps really make them attractive. It won't stay that bright green, hopefully. If I were going to do a person and do their eyes, I would start with skin color and I would take it all the way over the eyeball because the white of the eye is rarely white and a flesh tone is a, a good choice for that. He has that third eyelid right here. And it also comes out. And out. And just like us, there's an eyelid above that. There's a lower lid, and I would let this dry a little bit more, come back and lift a little. So again, I find that if I'm going to lift lines to use a little flat brush, it helps that a great deal, because it can only go in that one direction, so it keeps you from creating new shapes that you didn't want to have in the first place. And then below that, there's a little ridge of skin. So below that, you start with some fur, but leaving that little space in between. And again, you're paying attention to the growth pattern, and I wish I had been, because I was going the wrong direction.
Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Let's get a little color around this eye so he didn't look quite so strange. So I'm following this growth pattern above the eye. A little of this. Not sure how that came out purple, but don't care. Comes here and then stops. There's that little ridge where the orbital socket is. Has a highlight. Darker under here. Darker here. Ooh. Who's in my way? That's what happens when you turn your paper to the angle. People that uh, write with their paper at an angle are get in trouble when they try to paint that way because everything starts going in one direction, typically the wrong direction. as you probably were thinking when you were watching me do that. I'm just going to soften those edges. And it's good for you to know that like most paintings, they don't come together till the end. So all the way along the way, they're in different stages. Some look better than others. This is one of those that's the others. But it does help to start to create this entire shape that we're focused on. soften some of these outer areas. Just trying really quickly today. A little faster than I had expected. It's like plain air, which is a whole other world. not used to painting by myself without students to go, why'd you do that? There is light at the end of this tunnel, trust me. So even though his colors aren't even close, fur color, um, you can see the shapes. So when this dries a little bit more, all you have to do is come back and deepen the color with the same paints. And he will end up as a really cool dog. With little green dots in his eye. Let's take a break.